that in the first part of this adventure that we're on, the first part of the experience, uh, we covered chapter one and two. And in chapter one of the sutra, we were introduced to the environment, which is this city Vaishali. And we were introduced to the Buddha and all his assembly, all the Buddha, all the bodhisattvas and all the disciples. And then these 500 youths from Vishali, called their uh, Lichavis, showed up and all gave the Buddha a little umbrella, a parasol, 500 little parasols, and the Buddha miraculously turned them all into one parasol. And that sort of purified the Buddha realm or purified the realm that we're in and sort of set us on our adventure. And I sort of want, wanted to mention that because that's sort of the last time, you know, that's the Buddha's big uh, moment. Uh, because then the attention shifts to the, the star of the sutra, Vimalakirti, the, a lay person. Uh, but an extraordinary uh, lay person, of course, um, a bodhisattva, an enlightened being, but again, a unique, unique enlightened being. Um, and we're introduced to him um, and the sort of the point of the sutra is that Vimalakirti is sick. He's, he's grown sick, he's grown ill. Um, and of course, you know, if you study Buddhism, you study the Dharma, we're sort of dealing with this problem of getting old, getting sick and dying, aging, sickness and death. And so this is the point of the sutra to sort of inquire about illness in that sense. And Vimalakirti, who he himself is sick, is going to share with us his wisdom. And so indeed in chapter two, he shared with the people of Vaishali his great wisdom, uh, his great dharma and his great wisdom uh, regarding the body and illness. Then that kind of shifted us back to the Buddha with all of his disciples and all his bodhisattvas. And he had this idea, somebody should go check on Vimalakirti because he's sick. And uh, originally, we had 10 disciples, and this is all in chapter 3, that one by one by one, they politely declined to go see this very wise, very, uh, um, a very wise being. They were all a little intimidated to go see him and inquire about illness with his illness. So then that brought us to the next chapter, chapter four, where four bodhisattvas, also high adept enlightened beings themselves, also refused to go see the layman Vimalakirti. And so then in chapter five, we're introduced to sort of the other star of the show, the, the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, right? The bodhisattva of wisdom. Uh, he arrives on the scene, has a quick repartee with uh, the Malakirti regarding illness. And again, this is the point of the sutra. This is what they're talking about or the topic. But as each chapter goes on, the stakes are sort of being raised in terms of what's being spoken about. And then something interesting happens in last, last week, chapter six, where we were sort of introduced to the focus or the main practice or the, the main understanding of the sutra, which is the inconceivable liberation. And that's what we spent all last time talking about, chapter six, the inconceivable liberation. And I wanted to just start there really quickly. You know, uh, there was one last point that I wanted to make about the inconceivable liberation, which was called a vimoksha. Do you remember that? this inconceivable moksha or vimoksha. Well, really quickly, I just wanted to say that that cons it's a samadhi, a concentration, a very, very deep state of meditation. And of course, if you've been participating in the whole Vimalakirti experience, then you've been coming on Thursday nights to Michael Taft's meditation, which has been walking us through these conceptual ideas about the body and all of that. And within the moment of the inconceivable liberation, there's sort of something really incredible happens, which is that one who considers himself sort of embodied in this body could shrink or sorry, shrink or grow, stop time, move time. And all of a sudden things are getting really wild in the inconceivable liberation. And 
what I really quickly wanted to mention was, is that there's an interesting thing that happens in both the, the Tibetan, the Sanskrit, and the Chinese versions that is really glossed over in every English translation. And what it is, is that the person, uh, arguably person at this point, but uh, inconceivably liberated, the inconceivably liberated, right, in that sense, um, enters into or creates, in a sense, a datu, a realm, a vashaya datu. And it's a really interesting set of Chinese characters that I've been curious about. And it's a really interesting uh, Sanskrit construction of a, the construction of a, like a perceptual reality. It's really interesting. It requires a lot, of, a lot more deep dive into that. It's not why I brought you here tonight, though. I wanted to mention this, though, because in the Chinese, when one enters this datu, this dimension or sphere, that it's called a, a gateway. Indeed, it is called a dharma door, a fa man. And so there's um, something going on that's hard to understand between the Sanskrit and the Chinese mentality and culture. For the Chinese, if you created a, a zone or a field, let's say of peace or of happiness or of great merit or joy, then that, there must be a, a way, an entrance to that field. <laughs> The Chinese sort of understood these places as like kind of more places in that way. And so there could be an entrance point, a gateway into that whatever it is. Whereas in the Sanskrit tradition and the more traditional Indian Buddhism, they speak of liberation, vimoksha. And as not so much of a, as a place, but as an action of being freed from these things. And so I just wanted you to know that these liberations or dharma doors as they're called are kind of these entry points to different dimensions again it gets really hard to parse this out but i just going to mention this because it's an, it's a theme that's going to keep going but i wanted you to sort of keep that in mind that we have been to this inconceivable state of liberation all right and so a few ideas that I'm going to talk about tonight are going to, uh, in particular, some ideas regarding pranya or wisdom, they're going to kind of piggyback off of uh, the last few chapters uh, when I get to it. So stay tuned for that. But I just wanted you to know that we're kind of have entered or passed through a, a gateway in the sutra. And there's, there's no turning back now, folks. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> no, no regressing, as they would say. So. Um, all right, so I think that kind of brings us right up to speed. My main kind of objective there was to introduce just a, fa a few key elements and a few key players, of course, the disciples, the bodhisattvas, crown prince of the Dharma. And, oh, and really quickly, too, I wanted to mention the funny thing. This, is, this will be my segue into tonight. I mentioned last week that there's this funny thing that happens where Vimalakirti, right before everybody shows up, you know, he makes his house empty. He makes all the furniture disappear. He, he makes all of his like servants disappear. He makes his whole family disappear. He makes everything and everybody disappear, right? And makes his house empty. And so at the beginning of the last chapter to sort of push us into the inconceivable realm, uh, Shariputra, one of the disciples, he asks, he looks around and he sees that there's, that it's empty. He sees that the house is empty. And so he asks, what, where are we supposed to sit? And I, I kind of gave my interpretation of that famous line, that famous moment in the sutra. I gave my interpretation of it, which was that for a Shravaka disciple of the old school type of Buddhism that was used to various abodes of meditation, dhyanas, samadhis, formless dhyanas, and was, had objects of meditation, for that mode of being, for that type of dharma, the monk asks, what do I put my mind on then? Where, where do I focus my attention? In this inconceivable realm of emptiness, right? Where there's, you know, we've already kind of obliterated no notions of the self and things like that. And so the idea of last chapter was answering this question of when you're dealing with emptiness or shunyata, when you're dealing with dependently originated reality, 
the this tricky thing well then where do i put my attention what are these what are, what are the objects and that was Shari Putra's question that led to the whole discourse last time. I mentioned that because we're going to do it again a little bit. And this is another line or it's another question of the uh, to Vimalakirti that I think can be a little mis un misunderstood or it's a little tricky, even though it's seemingly very simple. Um, and so we're going to hold off on the title of this chapter, which is the goddess. We're going to hold off on her for a second, right? Cause this is, we're doing narrative format style. So easy, easy. So chapter seven begins like this. Thereupon Manju Shri, the crown prince of the Dharma addressed the Lichavi, the Malakirti saying, good sir, how should a Bodhisattva regard living beings that's the question <laughs> now at first that question might seem like either like very insignificant or not doesn't make much sense at all or and so i wanted to just kind of clarify what's being asked and it's actually very helpful at this point to return to the title of the chapter which is uh, that in all, um, last week I mentioned there's these three Chinese uh, versions or translations of it that are very important for understanding the text, at, like scholarly in that sense. All three of those Chinese versions, the title of this chapter is Regarding Living Beings. Or as in one version, it's the types of living beings. Regarding the different types of living beings. And I'm going to digress for one moment, but just to quickly get back to it. This question, how is a bodhisattva to regard living beings, is much, it's much deeper, much more profound than you might first realize, especially if you put it in context with the idea of where are we supposed to sit in this house of emptiness? Well, in this house of emptiness, how are we supposed to think about sentient beings or living beings? Aren't they empty too? This question of, wait a minute, time out, Bodhisattva. In the realm of land of emptiness, what are we to do with notions of inanimate and animate, sentient and insentient, dead and alive? What are we to do with those distinctions? And so for the, for the Dharma heads, I want to take this brief, brief moment for what I'm calling Pranya 101. This is the, the Pranya. Last week we were doing the Abhinya, right? The super knowledge. Well, to, tonight we're doing the Pranya. Pra is this kind of a, a trans, like the, the prefix in English and Greek, trans transnational trans this trans that to like cross over cruise over this is trans knowledge right pranya and pranya wisdom in many ways the key text for understanding this type of wisdom is a text called the vajra pranya paramita sutra more commonly just called in english the diamond sutra or maybe the vajra sutra for short this is a key text in Mahayana Buddhism. It's a key text for understanding Dharma or Mahayana Dharma in that sense. What's very interesting and the reason why I bring this up is that in that sutra, the elder Subhuti, not Shariputra, who's been at it this whole sutra, but Subhuti, Subhuti asks the Buddha in that sutra. In fact, it's the whole point of that sutra. Subhuti asked the Buddha, hey, Buddha, if, if bodhisattvas are developing the supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, what's up with living beings? What's up? How are we to regard living beings? Subhuti asks the exact same question that sparks off the Pranya Paramita Sutra that cuts like a Vajra. Right? That's the idea of the Vajra Chedika or the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. And the Buddha gives this cryptic answer in the beginning of that. And he says, well, 
any kind of sentient beings that you could even possibly imagine, whether they're born from an egg, from moisture, from a womb like a mammal, or by transformation like a god. Even if I were to cause them all right now to enter Pari Nirvana, total liberation, not a single sentient being would ever achieve liberation. And Shabuti's like, wow, like, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? And the Buddha says, well, I'll tell you, any, Buddha, any Bodhisattva worth his salt or her salt, any Bodhisattva that's in the business of being a Bodhisattva should not cling to, get attached to, think of or conceive of and think of the world in terms of four qualities that things either do or do not have an atman a self or a soul i.e that things are like uh reincarnated beings or not or they have a, again a soul or a self that's an atman you should also not consider things as having the characteristic or the quality of an individuality a pudgala this is the idea of a personality so if a you could have the idea of a soul an Atman that's been transcending space and time and being reincarnated for eons and eons and eons and eons and eons. And then you could be smart enough to jettison that idea of a soul or a self or an essential self, but you might still maintain the idea of like, yeah, but you know, <laughs> there's Michael, right? Like personality. Like I get you that there might not be a future Michael or even a past birth Michael, but there's Michael me, right? Well, the Pudgala is like, nah, there's actually not even individuality in that sense. And in fact, if we take it one step further, Subhuti, there's not a sattva. A, and sattva means being, but here I'm clarifying it as a living being. This is the, the distinction of animate or inanimate. <laughs> and if you've been following all the Dharma talks in the past, which I'm not going to repeat here, of course, we're talking about Lakshana. Characters, characteristics or qualities of things. Oh, look, it's big, it's yellow, it's furry, it's a dog. You know, it's like the way that we understand what things are is through the characteristics or qualities. Well, the Vajra Sutra is wild because the Buddha says, yeah, these four qualities, yeah, they're just as illusory as all those other qualities. That something has a self, an individuality, that's, that it's a living being at all, and that it has jiva, a lifespan and because and there's a way in which these are all bound up that if you if you think something is living then it must ha have a lifespan like when it came into being its lifespan and then when it goes out of being so there's a way in which these are all bound up together and if you want to catch the cipher the original conversation between manju shri and vimalakirti was regarding the nature of the self and the nature of sickness. And he broke it down into this like five aggregates of sickness kind of a thing. The inconceivable liberation was talking about the sense of individuality, that you are an axis in space and time and you're clinging to it. And the inconceivable liberation is, is like an obliteration of that axis. So there's no individuality, but there is an individuality and that's an aspect of clinging right so that's where we're playing with this jiva will be next chapter by the way the idea of lifespan and i want to remind everybody here that we are talking about old age sickness and death that which is born that which gets sick and that which dies and all of this is 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 wrestling with that is dealing with that so i wanted to hip you to that connection with the vajra sutra the diamond sutra this this is old ground right Shibuti asked this. Shibuti is like, yo, I already asked this in the Diamond Sutra, right? So here we go again, though, folks. And this is going to be the, the Vimalakirti's answer to the question. How, hey, in this house of emptiness, how does a bodhisattva regard living beings, right? Vimalakirti replied, Manju Shri. Bodhisattva should regard all living beings as a wise person regards the reflection of the moon in water or as a magician regards beings created by magic. Now, of course, the, the, 
the Japanese Zen master Dogen, he liked to refer more to the moon in a dew drop, <laughs> make it just even that more precious, small and fleeting, right? The moon in a dew drop. But the Malakirti says the wise regard sentient beings as like the moon in a dewdrop, or like a magician regards magically created beings. Bodhisattvas should regard living beings like faces in a mirror, like the water of a mirage. Really quickly, I'm going to. I'm just going to kind of do a few of these, but I do want to kind of move through the ideas of the chapter. So I'm not going to dwell on all of these analogies because many of them I have spent nights on the, these analogies. So just very quickly, the idea of like face, like faces in a mirror. This is a very kind of profound type of contemplation or meditation, which is if I was even going to try to get a mirror and do like a, you know, a trick. But if you imagine and think about the surface of a mirror, and then imagine like gazing into that surface of a mirror and you see in it some furniture and then you see what you think is a person, right? The question becomes, well, how many people are in the mirror, right? Well, there's kind of nobody in the mirror. What there is is a mind that's used to ambiguating and disambiguating shadow and form that on the surface of that mirror can be like, I'm going to separate out that from that, from that. <laughs> but if you think about the, the contemplation here is actually to meditate on the, the kind of monolithic nature of the surface of a mirror. It's just one reflective surface and an even more interesting question is to ask, what is the color of that surface, right? Oh, well, it's any color, of course, that it's being, it doesn't have a color of its own. It's, so therein is Vimalakirti, that's how he looks at, at, at a living beings, regards living beings, as like reflections in the surface of a mirror or like mirages of water, right? Like the sound of an echo, echo, echo like a mass of clouds in the sky. This is a really wild one for those of who, who took my, the classes on similes and I did a whole night on the, the sutra on the foam. There's a whole sutra on the foam. Vimalakirti steps it up a not, notch. He says, like the previous moment of a ball of foam. <laughs> so not even like, like a ball of foam, but like the previous moment of a ball of foam, right? And so this is where Vimalakirti starts to put the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra. Woo, he's going to crank it up because as he goes to, and this is where I'm going to need to speed ahead here, he gets into these ones that he regards living beings like the tracks of a bird in, a, in the sky. Like the tracks that a bird leaves in the sky, right? Like the erection of a eunuch. Ah, like the erection of a eunuch, like the pregnancy of a barren woman. So he starts to get into these paradoxes, right? Impossibilities, okay? Let me, let me pause there. I got, a, I got a, an agenda for tonight that I would like to meet. So let me pause there. Any questions about this initial idea? Again, this is pretty common analogies. Um, over in my mural here, I put our plantain tree, which has no core. That's like the samskaras. Uh, I got the bubble. That's like these sensations, vedana, that just come and go. I got the little ball of foam, the little bundle of foam there, like lightning, like clouds. These are old analogies. In fact, one of the things I tried to do uh, in my DJ set, building up to the Vimalakirti Sutra, was start dropping these tracks of these similes of the foam and the bubble and the lightning and all of this, because again, these are really old Buddhist ideas. You know, okay. Questions, ideas, or comments about any of that stuff? Everybody's chilling? All right. So now, actually, I have a question about the chronology. Cool. So your talk last night, or time runs together, but yep. Um, 
the ten, I'm, I'm gonna... the ten geographies where okay. in chronological order. Where does this fall into that? Where does this lecture in the Bodhisattva fall into the timeline? I'm just really curious yep. how far we've gotten and where we're going. It's a very complicated question, but I can give you a very simple answer. Mm -hmm. You either take the sutra at face value and it's the time of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. So we're talking 500 BC, baby. You know, okay. that's like, or, or you want to get into some scholarly questions of like, okay, if Buddhism actually was a, a kind of a movement where a, he, there was a, somebody, the Buddha, that got some ideas going, but then it seems as if some people took those ideas and ran with them and, and started developing, then a sutra like this, most scholars think, comes from about maybe 200 BC. Okay. Maybe. Some people are not as, uh, they want to put it a little more in the common era, but nobody confront on some of the dates of the Chinese translating these things in the 200s. Mm -hmm. So it's at least from 200 AD. Okay. <laughs> and that's if they invented it that night and then decided to translate it in Chinese, you know? Yeah. So Interesting. But, great question. And so the school of the Bodhisattva. I Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, Tonya, uh, I can't hear you, so I'm gonna um, keep it moving. This is about the, I caught the beginning of your question that was about the Bodhisattva path, and indeed this is, we're gonna talk about the Bodhisattva big time, especially when we get to this side of the board. In okay, I'm gonna just chill then. Okay, cool, welcome back. <laughs> All right, so, Vimalakirti gives a much longer answer. You know, I encourage everybody, of course, to go through it with a fine tooth comb. Precisely thus, Manjushri, do bodhisattvas who realize ultimate selflessness consider all beings. So kind of an ultimate selflessness, thus they consider all living beings. Here's the great follow-up, though. This is the really juicy follow-up to the question. But Manjushri asked further, Noble Sir, if a Bodhisattva considers all living beings in the way that you just described, how do they generate the great love towards them? How do they generate great loves towards a mirage? How do I generate great love towards a a shadow and a bubble and all these things. So what's being translated as great love here, I got to spend a moment on this. There is a very old practice, a meditation practice that actually predates Buddhism. The Buddha supposedly learned this practice from people and then continued to teach this practice to his disciples. And this practice is traditionally known as the four Brahma Viharas, the four Brahma heavens or something like that. And they are a series of progressive meditations on metta, karuna, mudita, and upeksha. What is usually translated as loving kindness, metta, M-E-T-T-A, karuna, K-A-R-U-N-A, compassion, classic compassion, Mudita, which by the way, mudita means sweetness, everybody. I was one of those people that was under the impression that it meant joy. The word means sweet like honey. And so the idea is, is that the dhyanic state or the Brahma Vihara of mudita is sweet. It is very, very sweet and therefore joyful. But the word mudita, it's helpful to know, it means sweetness but is usually translated as joy and is often, uh, I don't want to say more accurately, of course, because it's not accurate at all anymore, but is translated as, mudita is translated as uh, empathic or empathetic joy. And it's a joy for others. <laughs> that Like you're really stoked for other people, like if they succeed or they're feeling good, it's like you, it's a very, very selfless joy. So it's not a joy... It's not pity, 
It's not the rapture of Gianna where you're like feeling really nice. It's actually you're happy that somebody else might be feeling very nice. And then finally, this fourth Brahma Vihara is Upeksha or equanimity. So that's actually what's going to be spoken about. But this is, this is our Vimalakirti. You know, he's going to take this and turn it on its head and turn it in a whole new way. But Manjushri's question is, is like, all right, but in this house of emptiness where people and living beings are regarded like mirages and like creations of magicians, how do I generate metta, loving kindness for such beings, right? Manjushri. When a bodhisattva considers all living beings in this way, he thinks, just as I have realized the Dharma, so should I teach it to all living beings. Thereby, the Bodhisattva generates the metta, the, the love, the, the loving kindness that is truly a refuge for all living beings. The metta that is peaceful because it is free of grasping. The metta that is not fervorish because it is free of all passions the metta that accords with reality because it is equanimous in all three times, past, present, and future. The metta that is without conflict because it is free of the violence of the passions. The metta that is non-dual because it is, it is involved neither with the external nor with the internal. The metta that is imperturbable because totally ultimate. Thereby, bodhisattvas generate the metta that is firm, its high resolve unbreakable, like a diamond, the metta that is pure, purified in its intrinsic nature, the metta that is even, its aspirations being equal, the arahat's metta that has eliminated its enemy, has eliminated its enemy, the bodhisattva's metta that continuously develops all living beings. So this is going to go on. I'm going to pause because I will get totally wrapped up in it. He goes on all the way to describe this kind of new bodhisattva version of metta. It's not the Theravada Shravaka metta, and it's not the old, 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 old metta that the Buddha taught. It is this non-dual metta, that is, it's meta because there's no inside and outside kind of an idea. So it's a kind of a non-dual meta in that way. Manjushri then goes on to ask, well, what is the Mahakaruna? What is the great compassion of a bodhisattva? The Malakirti replies, it is the giving of all accumulated roots of virtue to all living beings. Manjushri asks, well, what is the Mahamudita, the great empathic joy of the Bodhisattva? It is, the Malakirti replies, it is to be joyful and without regret in giving. Manjushri asks, what is the Maha Upeksha? What is the great equanimity of the Bodhisattva? It is what benefits both self and others without any exception. I'm going to pause there. Questions, answers, comments, ideas about this new version of the four Brahma Viharas. Are there Brahma Viharas outside of the four? Or does a Bodhisattva aim to have their mind in one of the four domains exclusively? Like, are the four, like, if mm. we're talking radio channels, yep. are these, um, they're Vihar mm -hmm. Viharas. The room's Viharas. Yep. Are now these the four channels exclusively? So it's a really great question. And I, you know, again, these, it's a great question because it requires a very complex answer in that way. I will say this though, it is a great question for tonight because whether there are frequencies that one's being tuned into, 
it's a good uh, upaya, a good analogy for some. Um, traditionally, a vihara is an abode, like your living room. It's a place you're chilling out. And it's helpful to know that in the old, old, old version that I referenced that the Buddha learned, it seems that they understood it as, as literally a ticket to heaven. You literally go up to places that are vertically up from here <laughs> that are sort of in the clouds and you go to these places and are in some traditions, they describe it as being reborn there. The Buddhist or the Buddha took this idea of these abodes and he sort of made them maybe more, or at least taught them, I should say, more mental abodes, yet still places, yet still here, 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 and here, or here, here, or so here, 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 and here. There was still a sense of their lo locatability, whether they be mind or physical space. Yeah. It's helpful to know that because the Malakirti here, we are actually going at the end of this sutra, or sorry, the end of this chapter even. You're not going to have to wait that long. The end of this chapter, we're going to a place where we are going to the abodeless. Mm. Mm, yeah, so juicy. So just hang on to that that idea, your question. Oh, and, and, um, and I also wanted to address your question of are there other of these abodes? And it's kind of like... Yes, no, maybe so, depends on who you talk to. But in the Buddhist tradition, these are kind of four that are spoken about and you kind of hear about them often and always in that way. Okay, so. thanks. Yeah, happy, happy to answer it. So again, these, these conversations between, oh, and I'm sorry, more questions. I get so I have so. a question. Yeah, no. Um, I don't know if you were reading everything but it seemed like the description of what does what is meta like if there if everything's empty and there are no living beings was a lot longer than the other three. Yep. Is that true? It or were is. you just reading more of it? Nope. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, yep. And and so does, is that related to the idea that each of the Brahma Viharas gets farther and farther away from being about the self and so that it's easier to conceive of the other three each one is easier to conceive of if there is no self does that make sense does my question make it, sense? it totally makes sense you know it's it's man these questions are so great it's tricky um i i okay so go back to your the first part of your question i didn't skip much i sort of just ended abruptly i'll put it to you that way Okay. The the Maha Maitri or Maha Metta section is much longer. And then those three get condensed and then get rolled in. And Vimalakirti, he's off. Or actually Manjushri and, and, and Vimalakirti are off back and forth. They're taking us to potentially abodes we've never even been to before, to go back to the question a moment ago. Uh, so it's a stylistic thing where... Vimalakirti starts you with what you're used to, gives you a couple little treats because he wants you to know, yeah, we're talking about the Brahma Viharas, but get ready because we're not talking about the Brahma Viharas anymore. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, if there's no more questions, we're going to get to the real star of the chapter the appearance of the goddess. So, I'll just start reading and then we'll see. I got a ton to say about the goddess. But thereupon, a certain Devi or Deva, a certain celestial being, a certain goddess who lived in that house, Having heard this teaching of the Dharma of the great heroic Bodhisattvas and being delighted, pleased, and overjoyed, manifested herself in a material body and showered the great spiritual heroes, the Bodhisattvas, and the great disciples with heavenly flowers. 
when the flowers fell on the bodies of the bodhisattvas, they fell off onto the floor. But when they fell on the bodies of the great disciples, they stuck to them and did not fall off. The great disciples shook the flowers and even tried to use their magical powers, but still the flowers would not shake off. Then the goddess said to the venerable Shariputra, Venerable Shariputra, why do you shake these flowers? Shariputra replied, Goddess, these flowers are not proper for the religious people. And so we are trying to shake them off. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Because um, it's one of those things, if you don't, if you're not in on the joke, I want you to be in on the joke, right? So there's actually a lot going on with these flowers. So we're going to start with the, the baseline, like the most obvious reference that's going on here is that there is and traditionally has been a prohibition for the monks, for renunciants, this is in the Vinaya, that they shouldn't not wear rosaries, garlands, shouldn't wear flowers, flowers in their hair, flowers around their, their necks. And so I drew uh, one of our little shravakas. He has like a lay on, a little lay of flowers, a little garland, right? One has the little one in the little Hawaiian one in, in their hair. As kind of a little funny tantric joke, this guy, a big flower fell right in his lap. <laughs> right? And this guy, he's totally covered with them. He's just like under a big pile of, of these flowers, right? He's got blue, he's got blue lotuses stuck all over him, right? So the idea of this, of course, is that it's supposed to be very funny. And these bodhisattvas, of course, they have giant piles of flowers amassing at the feet of their thrones that they, that they got last chapter, right? And, and so Shariputra's on a tizzy, right? He's like, oh, no, we're, like, we're not supposed to wear flowers. This is terrible, right? So that's the joke to which this goddess, and now, you know, um, devas, uh, these are just, the, not just, but these are celestial beings, but they're also, when we're dealing with um, the Sanskrit deva or devi, fem a female uh, god in that way, or the Chinese, all three versions of the Chinese using this heavenly woman, Tianu, right? In Chinese, Tianu, and in Sanskrit, these are the most ambiguous, broad terms you could imagine for a deity. So I went with like rainbow head, you know, I don't even know what this type of deva is going to look like. So I leave it up to you and your imagination. But Again, as far as Mahayana sutras are concerned, we shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised at the appearance of gods, goddesses, and devas. This goddess, pretty smart one here, replies to Shariputra. Don't say that, Shariputra. Why? Because these flowers are proper indeed. How so? Such flowers have neither constructual thought nor discrimination. But the elder Shariputra has both constructual thought and discrimination. Shariputra, impropriety for one who has renounced the world for the discipline of the rightly taught Dharma consists of constructual thought and discrimination. Yet the elders are full of such constructual thought and discrimination. One who is without such constructual thoughts and discrimination is always proper. So that's, that's the, this kind of, again, I kind of have been peppering this or teasing this from the beginning that, you know, in the sutra, like the opening chapter, when we were dealing with ideas of purity and impurity, and I was like, eek, everybody be careful, like ideas of purity and impurity. And indeed, the very lesson was that to label things as pure and impure, that's impure, that's nasty. Calling things nasty and not nasty, yeah, that's nasty. 
that's this sort of interesting um, kind of pranya type of wisdom, non-dual, arguably non-dual in that way. That's the type of wisdom that the, the, the goddess is saying to Shariputra. Your mind's all, you're all hung up on this, right? Um, if, I, if I may, just to clarify for anybody that's still a little confused about these flowers, there is a classic Zen story classic Zen story. It's almost, I'm almost obliged. I have, I like, I, I'm contractually obliged to tell you this story at this point about this two of uh, the senior monk and his student, right? And they're taking a walk one day and they come to a river or like a little river um, and a little creek really, you know, and there's a woman trying to get across the creek and she's having trouble. She's slipping. And the senior, the teacher, he goes and he helps, he kind of offers the woman her hand and she holds it and off she goes across the little creek. Now, it's a rule. It's in the rules, the Vinaya, that monks are not to touch females. They're not to touch members of the opposite sex. And so the student is like, oh my God, the master just broke the rule. Oh my God, he touched her. He touched her. And so he's sitting there as they walk, they're continuing their lovely walk, but he's sitting there and he's like, oh my God, maybe my master's not as enlightened as I thought. Maybe I'm going to have to find a new master. Oh my God, I can't believe he touched that woman. Oh my God, oh my God. Finally, a half an hour later, he's, he can't take it anymore. And he says, master, I have to ask. I can't believe it. You touched, you touched that woman. And the teacher looked at the student. He said, yes, I did. Are you still touching her? So, it, it, he's still touching her, right? He's got this woman on his mind, cannot get this woman off of his mind, right? Whereas we're to understand that the enlightened teacher did the compassionate, non-attached act, help, and then kept it moving. So that is sort of just, again, a little Zen story that encapsulates this same idea with this idea that Shariputra is all worked up about these flowers, right? But maybe these flowers, maybe these flowers aren't what we think they are, right? Maybe they're not garlands and adornments in that way, right? Any questions about the flowers? There's a, there's a little more to go, yeah. Cool. Um, Venerable Shariputra, see how these flowers do not stick to the bodies of those great spiritual heroes, the bodhisattvas? This is because they have eliminated constructual thoughts and discriminations. And by the way, constructed or constructual thoughts and discriminations, discriminations is discriminating this from that, here from there, any form of discrimination in Buddhism that then just discriminating this from that, me from you, that can get so absurdly delusional that it becomes like, like, like discrimination, like you can't, you can't come in here, like nasty, 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 like real nasty discrimination. Whereas when the Buddhists are talking about discrimination, they're actually talking about the same thing, the same act of discrimination, but the subtle dharma is that we have discriminatory minds that favor lots of things over other things. We think these things are pretty, those things aren't, these smell good, those smell bad. And so this idea of the discriminatory mind, the bodhisattvas have transcended the discriminatory mind. These guys are still hanging on to that discriminatory mind a little bit. And constructed thoughts or constructual thoughts is this idea of um, of constructed ideas based on characteristics and qualities forming into ideas about things, uh, mirages, phantasms, ghosts, all of that, right? So, see how the flowers don't stick to the bodies of the great spiritual heroes? That's because they've eliminated that type of constructual thoughts and discriminations. For example, Shariputra, 
evil spirits have power over fearful men, but cannot disturb the fearless. Likewise, those intimidated by fear of the world are in the power of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and textures, which do not disturb those who are free from fear of the passions inherent in the constructed world. Thus, thus these flowers stick to the bodies of those who have not eliminated their instincts for the passions. And these flowers do not stick to the bodies of those who have eliminated their instincts. Therefore, the flowers do not stick to the bodies of these great bodhisattvas who have abandoned all instincts. The language that Robert Thurman uses in translating this is instincts. It's tricky. But the idea is, is it's about samskaras, volitional thought formations, as they're called, knee-jerk reactions, prejudice, pre-formulated ideas. <laughs> That's all what's built into this idea of, uh, of, um, of these constructed thoughts and the discrimination in that way. All right. Quick question, Michael. Yes, please. Um, what is the Sanskrit? for this word instincts or or not on uh, the the what is the atom the referent there the samskara samskara is the word yeah well i don't have a sanskrit or tibetan version in front of me so i can't vouch for that i he does he, he has a footnote that which i don't think was helpful in determining what those instincts were so i'm not going to pursue it further but the idea, though, if, if, we, if we might not dwell on the etymology and the exact word, but the point, which is like pre-formulated conditioned thought patterns, right? Any, any type of idea of like, oh, I've seen one of those before. I know all about that. I know all about you and your type. <laughs> that is a pre-formulated, con constructed, discriminatory thought formation versus a bodhisattva's mind that is somehow kind of very open in that way, you know, that in a way, you know, can really see every little flower, if you will, not just the sea of them, but each distinct one. Word. Right? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions or ideas, comments about this teaching? I do have a question that's maybe not relevant, but I'm curious. Mm-hmm. So since the Bodhisattva are not discriminating in this way, are they renunciants or are they, or are they householders who are just on the next level? So, yeah, oh, yeah, that's another great question. So in, in some traditions or some teachers, it's sort of like, these are the renunciants, they've renounced the world, they've taken on robes, shaved their head. And the Bodhisattva path is like a, a middle path. It's like a lay path. Some people teach it that way. I don't teach it that way. I'm just letting you know that that's sort of one mode that people get in. I'm of the mind that the Bodhisattvas are like the uber renunciants, like way, like they write way renounce. And the idea being, um, the idea being, let's, let's put it this way, you know, Buddhism's talking about these attachments and clingings and desires, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say it's like donuts, like, mm, I love donuts, right? And one mode, one mode of being is to be a renunciant. And so then I'm going to go to a land of no donuts. I'm going to go to the hilltop where there's, they don't make them. I can't get them. And I'm going to slowly work through meditation on controlling this habit of wanting the donuts. Yeah. What about getting a job at Krispy Kreme to yes. save all sentient beings? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get and it. You don't eat, and you don't eat the donuts, though. I got it. Right? Yeah. How, which is harder? Which is I the real renunciation? Totally get it. Because the Bodhisattva path is something that one of my teachers, I was like joking, making a joke about something. And she's like, it's the choice that's already been made. Like you made the choice a long time ago. 
and <laughs> can't and all that choice. That's that's what they say. Working at Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. On that note, then uh, the Venerable Shariputra said to the goddess, Goddess, how long have you been in this house? How long have you been in the house? Now, if you, if you, if you were still in Vimalakirti's house, right? <laughs> Then, and he, this is like some kind of kami, come some kind of spirit of the house, right? But if you've been following the, the cipher trail I've been putting down about this house, Shariputra's like, wow, how long have you been in the house of emptiness, right? The goddess replied, I have been here as long as the elder has been in liberation. I've been here as long as you've been in liberation, buddy. Shariputra said, this is it. This is a great answer. He says, well, then you must have been here a long time. <laughs> is he trying to like pick her up? Right? <laughs> he, said, he says that. Well, you must have been here for a long time. And the goddess replies, has the elder been in liberation for quite some time? At that, the elder Shariputra fell silent. The goddess continued, Elder, you are called the foremost of the wise. Why do you not speak? Now, when it is your turn in the debate, you don't have an answer to the question. Shariputra replied, Since liberation is inexpressible, goddess, I do not know what to say. The goddess replied, all the syllables pronounced by the elder have the very nature of liberation. How is that? Liberation is neither internal nor external, external nor can it be hem apprehended apart from them. Likewise, syllables are neither internal nor external, nor can they be apprehended anywhere else. Therefore, Reverend Shariputra, do not point to liberation by abandoning speech. How is this? The holy liberation is the equality of all things. Shariputra replied, Goddess, is not liberation freedom from greed, hatred, and delusion? The three poisons? The defilements? The three kleshas? Isn't that liberation? The goddess replied, liberation is freedom from greed. No, the goddess replied, liberation is freedom from greed, hatred, and delusion. That is the teaching for the excessively proud. But for those free of pride, they are taught that the very nature of greed, hatred, and delusion is itself liberation. That's a very profound statement right there, by the way, folks. It dovetails into a number of Mahayana sutras that talk about the three kleshas, greed, hatred, and delusion, as being the, the birthplace of Buddhas to being the realm of enlightenment itself. And it's a very interesting idea where he, he says, but wait, I thought liberation was freedom from greed, hatred, and delusion. And she says, yeah, well, we teach that to the people that are very prideful. But if, but if you don't have any pride, then there's something else going on. So this is a deep kind of message about upaya in that way. And Shariputra upon, upon that replies, Excellent, excellent. Goddess, pray tell, what have you attained? What have you realized? What have you accomplished that has given you such eloquence? The goddess replied, I have attained nothing. I have no realization. Therefore, I have such eloquence. Whoever thinks 
I have attained, I have realized, is overly proud in the discipline of the well-taught Dharma. Shariputra then asks, goddess, I don't get it. Do you belong to the disciple vehicle? Do you belong to the solitary, ve solitary sagely vehicle? Do you belong to the Mahayana, the great vehicle? And the goddess replied, I belong to the disciple vehicle when I teach it to those who need it. I belong to the solitary vehicle of the sages when I teach it, when I teach the 12 links of the chain of causation. And since I never, ever abandon the Maha Karuna, the great compassion, I belong to the great vehicle, the Mahayana, as all need that teaching to attain ultimate liberation. All right, questions? You still doing good? So ultimate liberation essentially is formless non-duality and the moksha, just the freedom. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's a kind of a blunt question, but I'll, yeah, yeah, that's kind of it. <laughs> Just try to make sure that the ideas that I've got in my mind yeah. are accurate. Yeah, it's a, com it's a complex question, but, you know, like Shariputra, we're not going to stay silent. We're not going to be like, you know, what's the nature of enlightenment and be like. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're attempting to articulate it here in that way. And so you're what you are, what you kind of, how you paraphrased it. Great. The, the, Kind of the main objective here of all kinds of Buddhism is the non-attachment, non-clinging. Yeah. Period. Like writ large <laughs> to, to anything or anybody doing anything anywhere to anyone at any time. Kind I'm of a just thing. so curious about the path of the Bodhisattva. And before I go making vows that I probably already made, I want to be <laughs> sure that I know what I'm doing. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, keep, keep coming, keep asking questions and keep reading the Vimalakirti Sutra. That's uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yep. I have a question. Yep. yep. Right. Yeah, so like when you see seemingly discriminatory language being made by the goddess or, or whoever, it's like, it's the, the mode in which it's being made in a kind of non-attachment, you know, cause even talking about non-attachment and attachment is this kind of discrimination. There's a, there's this, that paradox yep. that always, um, if I don't think about it, it's fine. And then if I try to articulate it, it, yep. it kind of crumbles. So there's also, there's also a, a fun, uh, playful thing I, that I find is helpful to keep in mind, which is that, if if you if one and i'm not saying this is you but if one gets hung up in the historicity of this as if these are people talking mm -hmm. to other people mm -hmm. then you missed it this this text is very aware that these are magical creations mm -hmm. by the power of the buddha <laughs> and they are all very aware of being magical transformation bodies by the power of the buddha in that way and so they're putting on this show for you mm -hmm. A any form of discriminative thought that's going on is, you know, is is kind of you, and again, not pointing the finger at you right. that way. But <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it's all upai in that way, and so any use of it is going to be that ploy to, yeah, to to do something. Right. Yeah. Michael. Um, yeah. So uh, I I kind of forget because it's been a while since we did this that last time, and. Uh, it, uh, did they qualify any of the crazy shit that they're saying or they're just letting it fly and that's just that's just how it's going to be today people are not real and it's all bs and apparently malakirti knows more than practically anyone yeah uh yeah sort of kind of yes i mean i think actually man to the the real answer to that question i think is this the the reality of doing this in eight parts. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if, if we were really had the fortune of like a, a deep session, long session where we could do the whole sutra, 
the buildup would have been, I think would be clearer so that the, the, the discourse that's going on in this chapter wouldn't seem so unqualified in that sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, okay. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I like it. I'm, I, you know, I'm kicked back about the whole thing, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I remember just uh, you having said like, whatever, if I, from probably some other sutra, like, Hey, it's tough, but suffering is real. And you know, Oh we, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this seriously, in spite of the fact that it's all empty. Yep. And actually let me, um, we have to finish this chapter. We, can, we can't not finish this chapter tonight. It's one of those ones that just cannot be left hanging. And in particular, it, it, doesn't, it addresses your, your, your comment, Brendan. So is everybody good to keep going? Yeah. Sweet. So I'm going to do, do, do. I want to do the eight wonders really quickly. So I'm skipping a little part that's beautiful about the aroma of magnolia trees. <laughs> and so I'm going to have to skip this beautiful part. And I want to just m mention this beautiful thing where it says, um, um, the goddess says to Shariputra that there are eight strange and wonderful things that manifest themselves constantly in this house. What are these eight things? A light of golden hue shines here constantly, so bright that it is hard to distinguish day from night, and neither the moon nor the sun shines here distinctly. This is the first wonder of this house. Whoever enters this house is no longer troubled by the passions from the moment inside. This is the second strange and wonderful thing in this house. This house is never forsaken by Chakra, Brahma, the Lokapalas, and the Bodhisattvas from all the other Buddha lands. This is the, strain, the third strange and wonderful thing in this house. Furthermore, Shariputra, this house is never empty of the sounds of the Dharma. The discourse on the six paramitas and the discourses of the irreversible wheel of the Dharma. This is the fourth strange and wonderful thing. In this house, one always hears the, the rhythms, songs, and music of gods and men. And from this music constantly resounds the sound of the infinite Dharma of the Buddha. This is the fifth strange and wonderful thing. There are always four inexhaustible treasures replete with all kinds of jewels which never decrease, although all the poor and wretched may partake to their satisfaction from them. This is the sixth strange and wonderful thing in this house. Furthermore, Shariputra, at the wish of this good man Vimalakirti, to this house come innumerable Buddhas of the Ten Directions. For, that is the seventh strange and wonderful thing about this house. And furthermore, Shariputra, all the splendors of the abodes of the gods and all the splendors of the lands of all the Buddhas shine forth in this house. That is the eighth strange and wonderful thing. Venerable Shariputra, these eight strange and wonderful things are seen in this house. Who then, seeing such inconceivable things, would believe the teaching of the disciples? All right. Okay, so I had to read that. Beautiful part. I'm not going to comment on what all that's about. It's these beautiful and beautiful Dharma jewels that you can ponder what those eight, and you know, reference the eight from last uh, time, the eight liberations, all of that. But now we get to sort of the, the highlight of the night. It's a, a little later than I'd like it to be, but that's quite all right. This is where Shariputra turns to this goddess that has, has wowed him, floored him, right? And he says, goddess, what's preventing you from transforming yourself out of this female state? <laughs> The goddess replies, although I have sought my female state for these 12 years, I have not yet found it. 
Shariputra. If a magician were to incarnate a woman by magic, would you ask her, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? Shariputra replies, well, no, such a woman would not really exist. So what would there be to transform? Just so, Shariputra, all things do not really exist. Now, would you think, what prevents one whose nature is that of a magical incarnation from transforming herself out of her female state? Thereupon, yeah, think about that. Thereupon, the goddess employed her magical Siddhi powers to cause the elder Shariputra to appear in her form and to cause herself to appear in his form. Then the goddess, transformed into Shariputra, says to Shariputra, transformed into the goddess, Reverend Shariputra, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? And Shariputra, transformed into the goddess, replies, I no longer appear in the, in the form of a male. My body is changed into the body of a woman. I do not know what to transform. The goddess continued, if the elder could again change out of that female state, then all women could also change out of their female states. All women appear in the form of women in just the same way as the elder appears in the form of a woman now. While they are not women in reality, they appear in the form of women. With this in mind, the Buddha said, in all things, there is neither male nor female. Then the goddess released her magical power and each, the goddess and Shariputra, returned to their original form. And I'm going to stop there. Got one little part to go, but that was the, the peak of the moment there. Questions, ideas, and comments about what just happened. I mean, you know, Brendan, to your question, you know, you asked about this idea of, well, things don't really exist and da, 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 da. And I think that if we really wanted to touch what they're talking about, like, I mean, touch it by meaning, contemplate it really deeply. It's in that thing of, so, you know, it's, it's pretty wild, of course, right? Um, I'm actually glad that somebody asked that question about like, when's this sutra from? <laughs> this is pretty profound for potentially 500 BC, even if it's only from 2000 years ago, it's pretty f profound idea to have this, you know, first of all, this incredibly progressive conversation about sex and gender going on. Then this flipperuni, right? So now Shariputra is in the form of the goddess. And then she's like, okay, tough guy. Why don't you transform yourself? And Sariputra is like, I don't know what I would transform. Therein lies the, 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 that's the, that's the thing, Brendan. That's the, that's the idea. Okay. Is what they're talking about is these are Lakshana, long hair, makeup, flowers in your hair. I, that's another layer of the flower reference, by the way. It's not just about garlands. It's actually about dressing up wearing makeup, things that are considered female and things that are considered male. And these guys are like, no, we don't do the female stuff. And the, and the goddess is like, why are you discriminating what's female from male? Why are, you, why are you so discriminatory in your mind, right? And so that all culminates in this thing when he says, I don't even know what I would transform. Which lakshana, which quality, which characteristic? My Atman, my Pugala, my Sattva, my Jiva, my... And so that points directly to what all of the Dharma is pointing to, which is sort of this... 
well, you know, this, this, whatever you want to call it, enlightened state or whatever, which as the Buddha says, is neither male nor female, nothing to do with such terrestrial distinctions. Right. So that, that, that's how I was taking it was like, nobody's subjective experience, <laughs> but whatever's going on for each of us, it doesn't actually have a male female valence. It's just our reality. I, that's how I took it, not the like, what, am I going to change my crotch or am I going to change my chest or like, okay. maybe, you know, yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah, man. Yeah, this, this, conver this discourse or conversation about lakshana, characteristics or qualities, right? So we're talking about a, a, a bag full of now because we're talking about the, the qualities of being a individual self with a lifespan then we're talking about oh you have long hair oh you have protruding pectoral breasts oh then you must be this you must be that and it's and again from a buddha a buddha point of view not even a buddhist point of view from a buddha point of view it's also childish and silly in terms of discrimination in that way Especially when that, that very constructual thinking, that very discrimination is the root cause. And, and he's the one that busts in. He, he's the one that's like, hold on, guys. So, <laughs> by the way, here's a little Dharma nugget for you. Stop exactly. getting hung up on male, female. Yeah, and I mean, I've actually been... Um, there's, a, there's, a whole, uh, um, there's a whole world of this discourse that is is like i don't want to say it's buried but there is a world of discourse in buddhism that revolves around this idea of enlightenment being neither male nor female you know and it's really profound and and i'm actually kind of have a personal mission to bring it a little more to the fore because it's so present and it's so well articulated in that way so michael yeah no along those lines can you remind me is it is it the Mimala Dana Sutra that also talks about this female male thing? Yes. One of the ones we've read. <laughs> is it Vimala Dana? So very quickly, and that, that's gonna be a great segue. I want you all to know. So first of all, you might all want to know about this book if you're into tonight. It's called Women in Buddhism. It's by Diana Paul. And it is actually uh her i think they're all hers they might be a few others but mostly her uh, translations of parts of different sutras where she's called out a, a, a lot of the discourse that i'm talking about so this is a one-stop shop for a lot of what i'm about to talk about which is that there's a very famous section of the lotus sutra in which a naga a female naga so a naga is like a shape-shifting serpent creature being in buddhism and there's a famous moment in chapter 12 the devadatta chapter where this naga princess appears and the same discourse happens with maybe ananda that's about like oh you're so smart then why don't you stop being a woman <laughs> like what are you doing and she's like me why don't you stop being a man and it's like the same discourse that happens in the lotus sutra and then in the ratnakuta there is a sutra called the discourse on ready eloquence but the real title of the chapter in sanskrit is vimaladana and it's a, also about a female who, and actually that is the best source for anybody that wants to follow up on this, is Ratnakuta Sutra, number, whatever it is, 33, I believe, 33, Discourse on Ready Eloquence, but it is actually about a bodhisattva, a female bodhisattva named Vimaladana, stainless giving. And I talk about Vimaladana as like Vimalakirti's cousin. Very similar discourse, also about the inconceivable, a lot of the same ideas, also the discourse with the, why don't you change out of being a female? Why don't you change out of being a male? So this is a thread that runs through so many sutras um, that it seems to have been popular for a minute. And then lo and behold, it seems to have subsided a little bit. So 
So okay. thanks for reminding me of that, Noam, because yes, that's a good one. All right, we have one more thing. Okay, so, well, maybe I shouldn't. I mean, yeah, are there any more questions? So it's just this little bit at the end that, so after they change back, she changes them back. So now she's the goddess again, he's Shariputra. And the, the goddess says to him, <clears throat> Shariputra, what have you done with your female form? Right? A fascinating question to ask kind of anybody, right? What have you done with your female form? And Shariputra replies, I nev neither made it nor did I change it. And the goddess replies, just so. All things are neither made nor changed. And that they are not made and that they are not changed. That is the teaching of the Buddha. And now I kind of want to remind you what this discourse is all about. Our sick, the Malakirti, getting old, getting sick and dying, right? And so, Shariputra asks, Goddess, where will you be born when you transmigrate after dying? And the goddess replies, I will be born where all the magical incarnations of the Tathagata, the Buddha, are born. <laughs> Shariputra replies, but, 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 but the emanated incarnations of the Buddhas do not transmigrate, nor are they born. And the goddess replied, all things and all living beings are just the same. They do not transmigrate, nor are they born. Shariputra replied, goddess, how soon will you attain supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment and become a Buddha? The goddess replied, at such time as you, elder, as such time as you become endowed once more with the qualities of an ordinary individual, then will I attain the perfect enlightenment of a Buddha. So he says, when I go back, when you go back to being a, a normal person again, and that's when, and Shariputra replies, goddess, it is impossible that I should become endowed once more with the qualities of an ordinary person. And the goddess replied, just so, Shariputra, it is impossible that I should attain the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment of Buddhahood. Why? Because the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment of Buddhahood stands upon the impossible. Because it is impossible, no one attains the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment of Buddhahood. Shariputra. But, but, but the Tathagata has declared that the Tathagatas, the Buddhas, who are as numerous as the sands of the Ganges rivers, have attained perfect Buddhahood, are attaining perfect Buddhahood, and will go on attaining perfect Buddhahood. And the goddess just shook her head and replied, Venerable Shariputra, the expression, the Buddhas of the past, the Buddhas of the present, the Buddhas of the future is just a conventional expression made up of a certain number of syllables. The Buddhas are neither past, nor are they present, nor are they future. Their enlightenment transcends all three time periods. But tell me, Elter, but tell me, Elder, have you attained sainthood, our hotship? It is attained because there is nothing to attain. And the goddess replied, just so, just so. 
there is supreme unsurpassable enlightenment because there is no attainment of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. Then the Licha Vivimalakirti said to the Venerable Shariputra, Venerable Shariputra, this goddess has already served 92 million billion Buddhas. She plays with the super knowledges. She has truly succeeded in all of her vows. She has gained the tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. She has actually attained the state of irreversibility. She can live wherever she wishes on the strength of her vow to develop all living beings. And that is the end of chapter seven. Comments, questions, ideas, epiphanies, a lot going on. Tried to cover it all. I left out a lot. <laughs> so I have a comment. Cool. Is it that one cannot attain enlightenment because there is no one? There's only the non duality, there's the non dual. Oh, it's well, it's sort of it's sort of like this. Um to simplify <laughs> all yeah, of this complex information. Why not? Let's do it. The idea is um so uh what could I use? I'm always looking for good props, right? So I have a ruler. <laughs> That's a funny one. So mm -hmm. I got a ruler. You have an right? architect scale. That's architect scale. Thank you. So I've got one of those, we'll call it a ruler, got a ruler. And the idea of a, a lot of this is that there's a way that this, the, the, the ruler, that, that's, that's, this is not me, yeah. right? This, this is me. And the idea is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, if you, if you, and, and, you know, with Upaya, I'm always going to just, this is just one example that shouldn't be taken too seriously because it's got a lot of holes. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, the sensation or the experience of being a sentient individual being yes. that, is, that, that, that is somehow, that is somehow this, right? Mm -hmm. But that if I started, you know, cutting off little parts, the yeah. hand and the fingers, I, I can show you, okay, so I'm not the fingers because I can dispense with those and I'm still so-called me. Now we're getting to Shari Putra's question of I don't know what to change anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea, the, the idea is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, I, I, I don't think I'm this, but I think I'm this. But that's yeah. actually a product of clinging. Yes. That that is creating this experience of only being this and then you're you're you you're who you are. I don't know, you know, you're all who you are. I'm just this. Yeah. What's being described though is a is a mode of being that is not clinging to this axis in time and space and physical physicality. Yes. And and as a preliminary, as a preliminary, as yeah. a stepping stone you could just as easily identify with this as well. Yes. And be all inclusive in that way. And now our bodies are getting bigger, growing in that sense. Yeah. The, the point is though, is that that clinging that is saying, yeah, I'm just this and you guys are all just you. It's just from a Buddhist point of view, an arbitrary clinging distinction. Yes. And so the liberation is not doing that. And wow. so no, no clinging axis in space and time yes. ever gets enlightened because that's the problem is thinking of exactly. ourselves as clinging axis in space and time. Oh my God, I got it. <laughs> yes. so. This is amazing. I just kind of stumbled upon this. It's your first time like, here. <laughs> every time Bodhisattva anything comes up, it's like we're just back to work. Hashtag Bodhisattva. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, folks, that's time. So unless there's any burning, 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 burning questions, I think I'm going to pass the mic. Awesome. All Thank right, you, Michael. folks. Thank you so much. <laughs> I know uh, this. I totally agree uh, with Tonya. This is awesome. And I'm really glad you're here. And I'm really glad we're all here together. This is the most fun you can possibly have on a computer on a Sunday night. <laughs> Um, so thank you. And uh, for those of you who do have a lot more questions and may not know this, Michael takes students and tutors people. Um, so if you follow that link that I put just now in the chat to his SoundCloud, um, you can also see his email address there. You can get him through there. Um, and he does sutra study, Dharma tutoring, um, you know, helps you get over your thing with Krispy Kreme donuts whatever it is. Um, if you had fun tonight, come back on Thursday. We do um, the sutra part of this on Sundays. And then on Thursdays, Michael Taft does a guided meditation uh, to go along with whatever we learned on Sunday. And if you've missed anything, the whole series is on our YouTube channel, which is just SF Dharma Collective. So check that out. Um, please donate if you can. The Dharma Collective is entirely volunteer run and community supported. Um, so the reason we can keep doing this is because of donations from uh, people who come here. So please donate if you can and know and put those links in the chat. Um, so you can copy and paste those. And come back on Thursday, same time, same place. One last announcement too is I know uh, some of the people in this room also come to Psychedelic Sangha on Saturday night. And um, Psychedelic Sangha has, you have to pre-register for it now. So you can see details for that on our website, but definitely if you want to be there on Saturday night, you have to pre-register, so do that. And I think that is all for breaking Dharma Collective news. It's great to see you all. And uh, please join me in thanking Michael again for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Wow.